hopefully share my screen. All right, industrial networks part A. Everyone can see the presentation. Good to go. Good to go. All right, so industrial networks part A. This is uh, best thing I get, think I can say as we start heading into this ILM is now's a good time to kind of uh, take a step back. We, we've been talking about uh, field buses and different types of protocols uh and and things like that you know at a smaller level we're kind of inside the plant and we're looking at you know a little uh, i don't know micro whatever is we you know we talk about the field network and the contro uh, controller network and the uh operations network and, and all that kind of stuff uh we're kind of going to take a, a kind of a step back right now and look a little bit more generally uh, what we're going to define as an industrial network in a, in a kind of a bigger scope. And it's more in uh, how do we get information between major, major users, I guess. So it's kind of more of an overview of how that data moves back and forth. We've talked about, yeah, there's this network and there's this that network and this kind of network. But now we're going to kind of look at the, those individual networks, the, the actual infrastructure uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, and for the most part in industrial networks, you know, we're, we're field bus or, or peer to peer twisted pair wiring from a field device uh, to our IO. And then from our, from our IO or our, our communications card and any kind of communication above that. So from controller to controller, let's say, or controller to uh, any of the workstations at the enterprise level or the operations or engineering level, that information is generally going to get transmitted via Ethernet uh, in, in this day and age. So this ILM speaks mostly to, uh, to that, uh, uh, Ethernet in particular, and, and wired Ethernet and wireless Ethernet, and kind of the dirty little details about how all that kind of works. So I've got a lot of slides uh, compared to the number of pages in the ILM here, but um, I think I picked out some good uh, some good juicy bits for you to kind of get you uh, a good a good understanding of all the, all the little details that kind of go into the data moving back and forth between uh, areas and again in the distributed uh, control uh, network which means that we've got different pieces of equipment in many different places either locally or remotely so it uh, ties in of course with everything else we've talked about so far. So our objectives here, uh, three objectives in this ILM. The first one is to, to talk about network topology. So that's the way that the networks are uh, physically laid out, kind of like streets and avenues and, and that kind of thing to sort of make a comparison. Then objective two says uh, we're going to describe the different area networks and applications. Um, I think this is a bit of a review. Um, we talked about uh, personal area networks and local area networks and wide area networks and municipal area networks and things like that already. Am I mistaken there or have we mentioned those already somewhere? Yes, no? Ringing a bell for sure. It's, it's ringing a bell ring. Well, that's as good as an answer as I think I'm going to get, so I'll take it. Uh, third objective says describe network components and characteristics. So we'll start talking about some of the hardware that's involved in a network. Uh, lots of this stuff uh, will, as Ray says, ring a bell uh, as, as we start to mention it because it's not only in industrial systems. Uh, it's also in, uh, you know, commercial systems, residential systems. We have hardware in our houses uh, that connect us to the internet. Uh, and that's the same essential stuff, just you know the difference is uh, price of the equipment and and you know the reliability uh, factors that have to be uh, incorporated when we're talking about an industrial application where downtime uh, costs lots of money. So we'll compare industrial equipment, which is very similar to to commercial or residential equipment, uh, 
in terms of commercial off the shelf things that you can buy, you know, like going to Best Buy and grabbing a router or a switch or a hub. And then what Alan Bradley is going to provide you or what, you know, some other vendor is going to provide you uh, in terms of hardware. So pretty basic general understanding objectives here. So how, how the networks are, are put together physically, where do the wires go and what does that look like? Uh, what do we call those configurations? Um, and then what are the pieces that actually get put together? So this is, should be not too bad. A lot of slides, but not too bad. Okay, so topology, uh, again, is the arrangement of computer network parts or how it's put together. The arrangement is dictated by the physical layer. And again, we're gonna be referring to the OSI model quite a bit. Um, not a whole bunch of it, thankfully, but uh, at least a couple layers in this lecture. So topology is a physical thing. It's how you lay it out. Where, where are the pieces? What are the pieces, that thing? So that kind of stuff is carried uh, or mandated in the physical layer of the OSI model. If you've forgotten already from last lecture, the OSI or Open Systems Interconnect is an architectural model that is a guide for network development so that everyone that has a network makes it the same so that they can interconnect with each other. The model has seven layers. We've only focused basically on the first, you know, what did we get up to five when we were talking about product protocols? I think we made it up to five or, or four different layers uh, out of the seven. We're basically going to be focusing on, on the first two layers uh, here when we talk about networks. The, the physical part of it, where how do we put it together? And the data link layer, which is how does the how does the da data get packaged uh, so that we can send it? Is that you know like an envelope or is it in a parcel? And do we use bubble wrap and that kind of thing? So basically, the two bottom layers of the OSI model is what we're after uh, in this ILM. Okay, so again, here's the seven layers, just for review, and we're concerned mostly uh, in this ILM with the physical layer and data link layer. And just to review here, the physical layer concerned with the transmission. Um, maybe I don't like this definition too much, but concerned with the transmission of unstructured bitstream over a physical medium. So we're talking about wires or wireless, um, dealing with the mechanical, electrical, functional, and procedural characteristics to access the physical medium. So how do we get on to the network? What equipment do we need? What wires do we need? Uh, that kind of thing. Then the data link layer here provides for reliable transfer of information across the physical layer, sends and receives frames, and we've mentioned frames earlier, uh, with the necessary synchronization. And I don't know if we talk too much about synchronization. Uh, back in the very beginning of uh, communications, we talked about synchronous and asynchronous communication, and that's kind of uh, what we're talking about here with synchronization and flow control and error control so we haven't talked very much about flow control uh, we have mentioned error control we talked about uh, parity bits block check characters cycle redundancy checks and things like that so a lot of the things we'll talk about today are uh, just elaborating on points we've brought up earlier okay so physical layer what is included in there in my words versus what the table on the previous page said it includes the network hardware, so wires and connectors would fall into that category. Uh, the electrical signaling method, so what voltage levels, how do we how do we detect changes in ones and zeros would be covered in this area here. So the physical the signal itself, how is it built, and how devices in the network are connected. So this is specifically speaking to topology. So what does the physical network look like? And we'll define that in a few different ways. So for us, uh, as instrument and control technicians, this is a meat and potatoes for us, right? Hooking, hooking it all up. The more we know about it, uh, the less we have to rely on the electricians uh, doing it so we can claw back some work from uh, some other trade, probably, even IT. Okay, so signal types, what we're talking about in industrial networks here, um, again, part of your focus is on digital data for the most part, uh, but for a quick, quick review here, we, uh, we do talk about a couple, and again, these signal types are defined in the physical layer, and we're going to talk about baseband signals or modulated AC signals, and we've discussed these before, so it should be quick review here. 
Okay, so baseband signals here are digital signals and represent ones and zeros using DC voltage levels or transitions between DC voltages. Two most common ones are, or the ones that we're going to talk about here, and there's a couple of pages in the ILM that uh, discuss these. I'm not sure if I have slides in here or not. I think I probably do because there's lots of slides. The two most common digital signaling methods that are used in industrial networks, first is called basic NRZ or non-return zero. And the basic idea behind non-return zero, similar to the way the name goes, where zero volts is never used and uh, logic one, which is called a mark, is a negative voltage, and logic zero, which is also called a space, is a positive voltage. So uh, one of them is a positive one volt, let's say, the other one is a negative one volt, let's say, and that's got some issues, and if the slide doesn't mention it, I'll, I'll come back to that. The second common one, uh, digital-wise here, is called Manchester Encoded. Uh, there's a few different kinds of Manchester, and there's a few variations on all of these, but again, a general idea of a couple of them anyway. Uh, Manchester encoded are signals where the ones and zeros are set by the transition in voltage. So either the voltage is rising from uh, a low voltage to a higher voltage or falling from a higher voltage to a lower voltage. Uh, and the best way I can think about this is it's kind of like uh, if I ask you, uh, how do you set a pressure switch, right? Uh, a high pressure switch, you set it on a, on a rising signal, right, as the signal is increasing, and a low pressure switch, you set it on a falling signal. So same idea, but in a digital uh, application. Okay, so good, here's a slide on non-return zero encoding, uh, and quite simple, it's constant negative voltage representing a one, Constant positive voltage represents a zero. So you see on our little scale here, positive voltage, negative voltage. And when it's negative, the signal down here, it's a one, it's a one. When the voltage is up here, it's a zero. So this is how we represent one, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero. So the issue with non-return zero encoding is because it's possible for a uh, zero or a one to be continuous for extended periods of time, it can waste power, right? If it's at a positive voltage or a negative voltage, it's still at a voltage. It still has a required current draw that is required to make that voltage uh, go. So it's kind of a downfall. So non-return zero, positive voltage, negative voltage. It's at a voltage at any given time regardless. Manchester encoding, on the other hand, looks a little bit different. And you'll see here, there's a transition line here. So we have a baseline signal that splits our pulses in between here, okay? So what happens here, we have a low to high will represent a binary one, and a high to low will represent a binary zero. The transition is, is unique and incorporated in here because it serves as a clock. So it synchronizes the communication between the two ends, the transmitter and the receiver. And we don't have to elaborate on that in particular, but this is just showing you that this is, uh, it's got more benefits than the non-return zero style here. So what are we talking about? So from a low to high or a high to low. So high to low represents a zero. So here my signal is high, it's above the baseline, and it's transitioning from a high point down to a low point. We say a high to low represents a zero. So now my signal is low. It changes from low to a high. So that's one. It's sitting at a one. It transitions from one down to nothing. So this is a zero. So this is what we call Manchester encoding. And the benefit we get again from that is the timing factor of it here. And because it's always in a cycling transition, the net power usage is zero. So it takes care of that problem uh, that we addressed with non-return zero. So those are the two digital types. Then we throw in modulated signal here one more time because it applies to heart and heart could be either or or both. Uh, modulated signal is a DC baseband signal that is covered, converted, sorry, or modulated uh, into a sine wave and, and back. Go ahead, Michael. 
last time we discussed the voltage range for IS-232-485. What is the yeah. voltage range for this non-return zero or Manchester encoding? Good question. Um, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. And I'm looking in the ILM here on page four, and it says that it uses a, a TTL logic signal. So TTL, um, I'm not sure of the exact translation, but I believe it's basically transistor logic. And that usually is a zero to five volt scale, which would tie in pretty well with our analog to digital four to 20, 250 ohm resistor, zero to five volt conversion, right? So that's my answer. I don't know if it matters or if it's for sure correct, but I'm, I'm thinking that it probably is. Good enough? Thanks. Okay. So here again, modulated signal, blah, 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 sine wave. Uh, the most common one, and of course, the one that we're most familiar with here is the Bell 202 FSK, where the logic one is 1200 hertz, the logic zero is 2400 hertz. And you can tell if you took a block of these uh, frequency waves and you did a peak to peak on them here, and you'd see that this is uh, 1200 hertz. This one here, much faster, the peaks are closer together, 2400 hertz, and representing a one with a higher frequency. Uh, and they, what the hell's going on there? What is that on? Do I have these backwards? At any rate, it's a review for you guys. Not a big deal here. Um, modulated signal benefit here again. They're not digital, I guess. So as a result, they don't use those termination resistors that we've seen in some of the uh, other field bus protocols that that demand uh, more specific tolerances and, and these termination resistors. Uh, they are better for long distances, it says. Why is this? I must have this. Uh, I must have this mixed up because uh, if I'm looking at this, that's a higher frequency than this, and that doesn't line up. No big deal. I'm sure. You, hang on. Let me just double check. So what you get for pinching a graphic from somewhere it doesn't belong. All right. So two digital signals, non-return zero in Manchester. Uh, and then the modulated signal here, uh, the heart signal, or the one that we require the frequency shift keying for. And just in case you never knew what the hell frequency shift was, it's because we're changing frequencies, right? We're shifting from this frequency to this frequency. So that's why they call it frequency shift keying. There is also a method called amplitude uh, shift keying, or ASK, in which case you'd have uh, similar peak-to-peak -peak times but the amplitude of one of the digits would be higher than the other one, just, just for fun. It used to be an accidental uh, question many days ago. All right, network hardware, moving along here, page six. So this is again, still in the physical layer. The hardware will of course vary based on the type of network and the cabling requirements. Uh, there usually, there's lots of them out there, of course. So we've talked about RS-232 connectors and 26-pin connectors and 9-pin connectors and all different kinds of stuff. Um, but most of the time when we're talking about Ethernet connectors here, we're talking about RJ45 uh, type connectors or maybe some of these specialized uh, industrial connectors that are, that are available. Some of these may look familiar. Uh, remember baseband uh, digital transmission uh, mediums, wires, uh, may require termination resistors, and all of the ones that we look at, uh, except for heart, would fall under that warning. Topology, so here we get to that wonderful world uh, of topology here that describes how the devices are put together. Uh, the three ways that we look at are called star, multi-drop bus, and ring. And the names do an excellent job uh, of describing them. I should have probably changed this graphic to something a little prettier by now, um, but I didn't. But nonetheless, peer-to-peer, -peer, as we've discussed before, is one machine to one machine. Uh, bus or field bus, as we've come, come to call it recently here, is a trunk with drops. And then we get into some of the new ones here. So ring, very self-explanatory. All the devices are 
configured in, in a ring so the data goes from one to the other in this sort of format. And then star, sort of self-explanatory, I guess they can add a few more of these on there if we wanted to, it would look more like a star. And um, this one's not part of our concern here, but uh, another one that's becoming popular in wireless networks and, and wireless devices that we're seeing in industry uh, is, is a mesh network. And maybe I'll talk about that a little later, a little later on in the presentation, but I don't think it's mentioned in the ILM, um, but it's becoming more and more popular. Okay, star topology here, very common. Uh, we have a hub in the center here. Uh, all the devices are connected to it, and we call this one a hub. Uh, it could be also a switch. Uh, they do essentially the same job. We'll talk about these individual pieces of hardware in the next objective, but uh, doesn't change the topology here. So all the devices connect to this hub. Um, this is very common. This is kind of the way your you know your work office or uh, the, the school probably works on this. I'm not an IT guy, so I'm not going to say that for sure. But most likely, this is the way it works. Uh, you have a server room that's got a bunch of these hubs in it, and you got everybody's computer running via uh, Cat Cat five or six cable uh, up in the ceiling, and all the wires come down to this room that has the hub in it. And this hub goes to another room that has, you know, you tell two friends, they tell two friends, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. At any rate, start topology, hub in the center, and all the devices connect to it. Downside to a hub, of course, is if we lose the hub, everybody's out of luck. Okay, multi-drop here. Very familiar with this. We've done nothing but talk about this for the last couple of days. Has a main trunk line and drop lines or spurs going to the end devices. Uh, totally off topic, but just to keep you awake, foundation field bus, what's the maximum spur length for a cable? Six meters. Good job, Ray. All devices are connected in parallel. Okay, that's very important, right? Versus uh, a wire breaking in a series circuit screws the whole circuit. A wire breaking in a parallel circuit hopefully can only affect uh, one of the devices. Uh, this is, of course, most common in field bus networks, as we see on the slide here. Uh, downside here, uh, usually only half duplex, something that they're going to throw out there. You, you see this in the, in the field. Uh, more than you you do in the higher levels. Okay, ring topology here. Uh, all devices are connected in series when we're looking at it in electrical terms here, or daisy chain, you might have heard this before. A um, little bit less common, used for RS-232 and, and often in some fiber optic, uh, fiber optic networks. Of course, the downside looking at this one here is if you were to have a break in the ring here somewhere, that's going to stop data from flowing effectively. Um, that's why we have redundancy. Okay, so these were all things that were in the physical layer. So it's a lot of different things that we've discussed that were in the physical layer there, you know, you know wires, connectors, signal types, topology. So fly a lot away up there in the big old brains. Uh, next, we're going to talk about what goes on in an industrial network that utilizes guidelines laid out in the OSI data link layer. So uh, as a review again, things in the data link layer uh, tend to be focused on the structure of the message frames. And this gets a little bit more complicated than frames we've looked at before. Uh, error detection, which we've already previously discussed. Addressing, uh, we'll talk in a little more detail about addressing. Uh, and media access method. Uh, I, mean, I think the only one we've really talked about so far was master slave, but we'll talk about a couple of uh, a couple of other ones here coming up. Okay, so the message frames we talked about before. It's how uh, the data is assembled. So it's like putting a letter together and saying, you know, address in the top corner or return address in the top corner. Uh, mailing address in the middle of the envelope and the stamp in the top right corner and et cetera, et cetera. You know, if it's a business letter, it's got to be eight and a half by 11. If it's a regular letter, it's whatever. How do you, how do you know all this kind of stuff? 
it's part of a protocol. It's a protocol of sending a letter. But when we're talking about uh, data and digital data, it's it's all contained in the data link layer and defined by basically the message frame. So as communication becomes more complex, methods are obviously required to enable more efficient transfer of data, particularly as we start sending more and more data on more advanced networks. So we do that using message frames or data packets. Okay, a data packet contains the address of the receiver, maybe the sender. Uh, it has some bits that help synchronize the communication, so timing, uh, error checking bits, and uh, things called stop and start bits. Uh, and we'll become more familiar with those as we drill down to them. I think that's in the next ILM. <clears throat> Okay, we've already seen some of these frames already, so we know that many manufacturers have their own frames uh, designed specifically to send their data. Um, but again, they you know they look they look something like this. There'll be an address in there. There'll be a, a function code, and then there'll be a certain number of bits of data, and then there'll be some kind of a error checking mechanism. Uh, usually at the beginning, they'll have a a start bit that'll tell you that data is coming, that will synchronize the clocks between the transmitter and the receiver. And then at the end, they'll have a stop bit that, that does the same thing. And it's kind of like the old days when you used to send a telegram, you know, you go, uh, you know, you've, you've seen it in the commercials. Da, 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 Raymond died in a terrible training class, crash, stop, uh, sell the stock, stop, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, ranting a little bit there. <clears throat> Error checking. Uh, we've hit on this before, so we'll look at uh, uh, three methods. It says here, and I know it. I, I looked at this earlier today and it says three methods, but there's only two here. Um, the one that doesn't get mentioned, I don't know if I have a slide on it, but it's called a linear redundancy check. I don't know here. Let me just look. I haven't got there yet. Let me just quickly flip in the ILM here. Is it in here anymore at all? Maybe it got deleted. Maybe that's why. It's LRC anyway, but it looks like this looks like it's disappeared. All right, so checksums. Uh, I believe we mentioned checksums previously when we were talking about block check characters. So a, a checksum is used. It's a component of a block check character, which is uh, a string of ones and zeros that have to match. Basically, it's a top secret code. Uh, and I believe we talked about this already, did we not? Yes, no. We talked about parity only being able to detect half of the possible error as you can see. Right? Yeah, we talked yes. about all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this this is kind of elaborating on that. So we talked about parity. Uh, it's either a, one, a single bit that's either a one or a zero, and you compare it, and you got a 50 50 chance. If the data is off by one, it, you know what I'm talking about. So evolving from, uh, from parity, then we got to uh, um, block check characters, I think, was what we were using. Uh, we were used as a term when we were talking about it, and we determined. I think this was also a statistic that was in there. And block check characters are much more uh, reliable in terms of determining errors, 95 to 99 percent accurate, and they're bigger, uh, so they can handle more data. Uh, there it is, LRC. So LRC is the one that kind of comes before this. We obviously aren't talking about it, um, but block check characters. Uh, a few hundred bytes, which is some data, not, not tons of data, but uh, you know, a good, good amount of data. So the next type of error checking here, the most evolved type of error checking here is CRC or cyclic redundancy checks. Uh, one of the most effective methods uh, using a shift register. And if you looked at the image of a shift register, it would look like a whole bunch of uh, AND gates all chained all together there to make a fancy code machine uh, and they call that code machine a shift register and each end's got one and it encodes and decodes the, the data so that it gets sent. Uh, it's the state of the union, it's the state of the art, it's 99.9999% accurate. It does larger data packets in the neighborhood of a few thousand bytes. So when we talk about industrial networks, it's going to be this. Okay, physical addressing also in the data link layer here and more important now when we're talking about Ethernet networks as we're going to be soon here talking about Ethernet networks. Um, 
we'll talk about specific addressing your 192.168.1.0 uh, type addressing. We'll get into that a little bit down the road here. So as we build up to that, uh, looking at the data link layer again, all the devices in a network are addressed. These addresses are static, meaning they do not change once we give them to them. Uh, you can set them to change if you want them to. Uh, in your home network, they change frequently. People come over, uh, you know, if you're like my house and you have the teenagers coming in and out all the time. Every time someone comes in and joins your wireless network, they get assigned an IP address and, and that can change. Uh, fine and dandy around the house, uh, but not a desirable thing in your plant. Uh, because if your control system is searching around for addresses that are changing all the time, it's not very efficient and you're not going to have good data transfer and that's going to be a problem. Uh, so anyways, industrially, they're static. They don't change. Uh, just like a host receives the mail by the address, data in the network does the same. So we want to make sure that you, you, you don't change the numbers on the front of your host so that the mailman's confused all the time. So how devices get data is handled in the data layer as well and is called media access and there's three main methods of media access and we've touched on these before uh, master slave uh, sometimes called pull response number two is called token passing or, or hot potato and i think i've mentioned that in a previous lecture and the last one i don't think we've touched on yet i, I can't remember but uh, csmacd or carrier sense multiple access with carrier detection uh, is the most common one and the, the current one that you'll find in, in Ethernet networks here. So they kind of, again, like most things in our lectures, uh, evolve as we go along here. So relatively simple, a uh, little bit, uh, you know, this expands on this a little bit. And then, of course, this takes care of the shortcomings of the previous two. Okay, so master slave, not like this. Uh, in this method, one computer is the master, the others are slaves, as we can see here, and the slaves only transmit when the master commands them to. This is very common because the master can be programmed to ask for data on a time schedule, and it uses existing wiring methods. So just on this data alone here, it tells us a few things. It tells us uh, something from control systems that we can have scheduled tasks or routines that happen all the time, or we can we can time them. So that's this kind of speaks to that. And it also uses existing wiring methods. So when we're talking about systems that use existing wiring methods, we are typically talking about twisted wire. Uh, so the lower technology uh, methods would probably use master slave, i.e. part. All right, not exclusively, but that just kind of leading you down a road to how to interpret some of the words that you see into where you could apply them. Second type here, token passing. Not this kind of token passing, this kind of token passing. So sometimes called hot potato. And I think we've been through this before. Uh, any device can send data, but only when it has the token. There's only one token and only one user can obviously have it. And what the token is, is a special code that's received from the network. And once you get that token, if you decide not to send any data within a set time, that token moves on to the next person. Same drill, if you've got data, you send it. If you don't, set time, moves to the next one, so on and so forth. So pretty uh, visually uh, descriptive. Last but not least, and um, uh, the Mac Daddy here, carrier sends multiple access with collision detection, commonly referred to as CSMACD. And you'll see this quite a bit now. Uh, another method that is used where many devices may want to send data at the same time. Okay, so this is lots and lots of data in a, in a network here. And this is the, the top of the evolutionary scale as we kind of are right now. It is used in some multi-drop systems and in a few radio networks. And it is what is used on Ethernet-based systems. And that's essentially what this ILM is about, Ethernet-based systems. Okay, so two parts, 
the CSMA part we'll talk about first and the CD part we'll talk about second. And good analogy to go with this description. Okay, so yes, sir, Michael. Sorry, I just have so many questions. Um, looks like making me look like more dumber than anyone else. Um, for your CSMA, is that current LTE network use the CSMA method? I am going to say, I'm going to say probably yes. I'm not an expert on LTE, but I'm going to say probably yes. I mean, in uh, in the cell phone network. Except the CSMA, what else we have? Uh, yeah, all I know more or less is what we cover in the ILMs here. So I know that in wired and wireless Ethernet or internet, I, I believe all, all we discuss is CMSA, uh, CSMA CD. There could be, you know, there could be more advanced ones for, you know, uh, cellular networks, but I'm, I'm not, I can't speak to that. Okay, uh, another question. You did not mention the network and the communication security. Uh, for example, for those token passing, what if someone took the hot potato and the token so lost? That would be that would be covered. Uh, that would be covered in the uh, network access provisions and in, in the software package for the network. So when you set up uh, user accounts and authorizations. That would that would be the way that, that that's handled. Uh, we'll talk about outside intruders uh, later on in the PowerPoint. So firewalls is the answer that you're looking for there, and we do talk about that in a bit. Thanks. Okay, moving on. So let's discuss how this uh, CSMA uh, CD uh, error detection method kind of works, and. and Seems big and technological, but it's actually really easy to relate to. Okay, so it works a lot like a regular human conversation. We want to talk, and you can close your eyes and imagine this, but uh, this is just walking you through the process, or at least the process as I see it, of when we have a conversation. So if we want to talk, we first listen to see if anybody else is talking. If no one is, then we begin to speak or transmit our data. If someone else speaks or transmits at the same time, uh, as us, the point of the conversation or, or the data could be lost because we've had a collision. My my data is colliding with your data. If nobody interrupts us, we keep talking and our message gets across, right? So if I'm having a one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one conversation with you and we've got some decent decency and manners, I'm going to say something, you're going to listen, then you're going to say something, I'm going to listen, and everything is good. However, if we put uh, hundreds or thousands of devices on a network and we've got millions of bits of information going back and forth, the likelihood of having these collisions goes up, of course, significantly. So the difference is between a one-person conversation and me trying to have a conversation with uh, somebody in a gymnasium, uh, you know, full of people. Okay, so that, that's, I think, a pretty good real-life representation of, of how the CSMA part of it kind of kind of works. So it's looking, it's looking to see if the data uh, makes it from one end to the other based on some type of a return signal or feedback that it's receiving. Okay, so this I got this in the PowerPoint two or three times. I don't know where it came from. Uh, oh, they've added one to the ILM that is fairly similar. Um, but it's a nice little block diagram, lover block diagrams that tell you, you know, kind of how uh what i described the work so we get some information comes in i gotta put it in a package and now i send my package out i say hey is anybody out there uh and then i ask myself is is anyone else talking if no one's talking then i say okay well i'm gonna i'm gonna keep on talking keep on talking do i do i hear anybody else no i don't hear anyone else so i'm gonna keep on talking until my transmission is finished and if no one talks i'm good right or I start out my conversation and say, hey, how's everything going? Is everything going? Oh, I hear somebody else. I can't do this anymore, so I got to come back and wait until that person's done talking. Once that person's done talking, I'll start transmitting my data. If 
If I don't detect, if I detect a collision, this person won't shut up. I gotta, I gotta go back and, and wait and go back and wait. So that's a block diagram. Moving on. So the collision detection part of this uh, CMSA CD part here, uh, we listen as we speak, and that's really the collision detection of this. Uh, if someone was to interrupt us, we would have bad data. So we're detecting the bad data because we've heard somebody talk over us, right? So then we pause, we start over. Same as the CD part here. The device transmits, listens to the network. If the data is good, it continues to transmit. If it's bad, we say that a collision has occurred. On a collision, transmission will stop. Each device then will wait a random time and then try to retransmit. And we've all had this awkward situation in a conversation. Oh, no, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead. Same idea. So we give ourselves a reasonable amount of time to let the other person speak again. So if each time is random enough, theoretically, we should not collide again. That's the CD part of it. Okay, a uh, special note here in unswitched CSMA CD networks, uh, we want to maintain our loading, communication loading on the network to less than 60%. And by doing so, we ensure reliability. Same thing when we talked about loading uh, of a controller uh, being less than 80% for reliability purposes. This is the same statistic um, relating to a CSMA CD network. Objective two. Da, 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 da. Area networks. So as the name implies, area networks are designated based on the size or area they will cover, right? Personal area, local area, metropolitan area, wide area. So maybe uh, whether it is in a building or across the country or in your office. So we're gonna look at four types of networks, uh, personal, local, metropolitan, and wide. Oh, look, there's no note down there. All right, so before I get into describing the dirty little details, and again, I think, do we talk about, I can't remember. It's I'm getting older, things are blurring, but uh, personal area network, uh, when we're talking a personal area network, we're talking about, uh, essentially, in our context anyway, uh, Bluetooth is a good one. Less than 10 meters, right? So good definition for Bluetooth. You walk so far away from the, the speaker, your phone disconnects, that's Bluetooth. Local area network uh, takes over, so from that 10 meters to about 5 kilometers. So this is your average uh, office building, uh, the college would be a local area network, uh, some, something of, of that size. Most uh, most petrochemical facilities, I'll say, fall under this category. Um, then moving up, we have the metropolitan area network here, and as the name would maybe lead you down the path of the size of a city. So five kilometers to 50 kilometers, this would include, you know, city hall, uh, the RCMP stations, the uh, water, wastewater plants, maybe some pumping stations on the outside of town, uh, that kind of thing. So a little bit wider uh, network. And then the top one here, or the wide area network, uh, greater than 50 kilometers. So we'll look at them uh, individually next. Okay, so PAN or personal area network here is designed to provide high data rates over short distances. They can be wired or wireless. Uh, the most common example of a personal area network is, of course, uh, Bluetooth, uh, named after the great Viking Bluetooth. Uh, it's not a joke, that's a true story. Look it up. It's, that's his symbol, it's based on a Viking rune. Next, Cliff Clavin trivia point. Uh, local area network, offices, hospitals. Is that gonna stuff. test question? I don't know. It could be. It could be. Uh, again, range of about five kilometers. Lands can also be wired or wireless. Uh, Ethernet and wireless Ethernet are common examples of a LAN. And we're, again, we're kind of building on that to, to where we get up to. Next one here, Metropolitan. Uh, I've never heard of it before. Uh, I started teaching this course. Um, but it covers larger, larger areas, like I say, uh, the size of a city. Uh, 
when we talk about MANs, you'll hear terms like virtual private private network and ISDN, uh, things like that. We do mention them a little bit uh, further on, but we're we're not really um, metropolitan <clears throat> sorry metropolitan network guys. <clears throat> Sorry. Last but not least here, uh, least the wide area network, same as a man essentially in structure and, and other things, uh, only of course much, much larger. Cellular networks would fall in there uh, as well as our uh, GSL networks would fall in there. So a wide area network connects us all. We tend to call this uh, internet sometimes. Objective three, trucking along here. Transmission techniques. So how do we get the data from here to there? And there's lots of them, sure, but we talked about the most common ones and they are ethernet, wired ethernet and wireless ethernet. And the designations for each of them, I would say at a bare minimum at the end of this, at the end of this ILM, you should know the designations for a wired ethernet and a wireless ethernet. Uh, not necessarily the sub designations, but at least the main designations. Yes, sir, Michael. Do you have those uh, IEEE 802.3 and 11 for sharing? Do we do you have this public uh, document? Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it comes up in the next couple of slides. Do we have access to those documents online, or we have to pay for it? Uh, no, I would. Have, I wouldn't, I don't have anything specific that I would give you in my materials, but I'm sure you can, you can just go wiki this, go wiki this and it'll tell you everything that you need to know. Okay. Don't, just don't, don't worry about what the, what the internet says, worry about what the ILM says. You don't want to want to overwhelm yourself. Okay. So we're going to talk about the two transmission techniques that we're going to talk about anyway are wired and wireless Ethernet. Okay, so these IEEE standards are, uh, are standards, groups uh, of rules that define the physical layer and data link layers, including media access control of wired Ethernet and wired Ethernet too. Uh, these wires can be copper or even fiber, and we're getting more and more fiber, of course, as we, as we evolve. Okay, as with most networks, the transmission technique is defined in the first two layers of the OSI model. What are the first two layers of the OSI model? Before I move on, somebody besides Ray. First two layers in the OSI model. Come on, boys. Network uh, or physical and data link. Yay, right on. Pretty cheesy, I know, but I gotta try to keep you guys awake once in a while. Okay, so we'll talk about wired Ethernet first, and then we'll talk about wireless later on. Okay, wire Ethernet standards 802.3 has sub levels that tell us what type of wiring is used. That wiring is identified by a particular naming convention. Here's how it works. I'm not gonna explain it to you altogether, but it's it's fairly basic. The number represents the speed. The base is baseband or broadband. And the number, as you can see, represents the speed and different cable types. Uh, T for twisted pair, F for fiber. Lots of good information in there. Uh, and it gets a little bit, you know, a little bit more specific. But this is basically what we're worried about here is what does the number represent, which is speed. Uh, the word is is uh, what type of signal is it, baseband or broadband, and then the T or the F usually refers to uh, the wire type or segment one. So here, for example, what do we got here? 10 base 5 is our example, so 10 stands for 10 megabytes per second. Uh, the B uh, baseband here stands for, uh, base stands for baseband, and then the third part is generally related to the segment type or uh, or length, so depending on what you got, what you've got going on here. So twisted pair for T, F for fiber optic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If it's not in the ILM, don't sweat it. Okay, uh, what can we determine by looking at the chart here? If I compare twisted pair to fiber, 
huge differences in the distance that we can travel. Okay, that's in a nutshell. Fiber optics are going to go way farther with way better data than you're going to get from any type of a wired uh, transmission system. Okay, again, physical layer Ethernet connectors. The most common one is RJ45, uh, which will accommodate four pairs, and this is just a big telephone jack. Yes, Michael. For that uh, Ethernet standard, um, they have different standard and different speed. Are, are they com compatible downwards or upwards, or they're not at all? So if I have a, a modem oh, with 100 uh, megabit, what if I have 10 megabit Ethernet cable or one oh, you, you ask all the tough questions. Um, I am only gonna answer this based on personal knowledge of my own home network. And that is, you can only transmit as much data as your hardware will allow you to transmit. So if you have a uh, 500 megabyte router, there's no point having uh, 1000 base T wiring, right? That's all I can say, but that is uh, outside of the scope of, of this course anyway. Good enough? Thank you. All right. You ask the tough ones. Okay, so there's the most common connector, the RJ45. And again, simple, not a very rugged type of connector because typically when we're talking about these networks, we're we're out of plant already. We're we're control room or higher usually at this point, and that's why you'll see uh, Ethernet connectors uh, that aren't as you know durable as industrial type connectors. Okay, electrical signal type. Look at this one. All modern Ethernet standards use baseband non-return zero and some form of Manchester encoding. Don't go looking for more than that because you'll find it. Just know that this is what most Ethernet standards are now based on. Uh, Keep it to, in our context because their technology changes faster than we can write ILMs. Okay, data link layer. Again, moving up here, um, frame structure, error detection, addressing, and media access methods. So we look at things a little bit differently uh, here when we're talking about specific transmission medium, uh, when we're talking about wired versus wireless. So they're a little bit different. We get a little bit, a little bit of detail change in here so you'll pay attention for that okay uh, message frames here we're talking about wired ethernet again 10 base t ethernet ethernet frames and that's probably the most common one or at least the one that we're worried about are always 1526 bytes long don't ask me how it is it just is uh, and have eight fields here's my answer to you if you ask me how i know this it's because there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight fields. And if you do some math, eight, 14, 20, 22, 28, and then another 1,500-ish. That's how they come up with that. Uh, we're not so concerned about drilling down into these frames uh, at anything deeper than what you're looking at here on this on this screen <clears throat> on this screen here so do understand what the basic blocks do here because they have unique names we've discussed what they do but they've got new names now so preamble synchronizes the incoming data for receiving so this is like a start bit for example right or sfd starting frame delimiter singles the end of the preamble so you just have a general idea of what what these blocks will contain. So destination address, source address, not again trying to make you guys network experts, uh, just be able to identify uh, an eight block, 1526 byte ethernet type frame. Okay, error detection again, I believe we we talked, uh, talked about this before. Uh, I don't think we've mentioned FCS before, um, but in Ethernet, 
wired Ethernet, the frame check sequence character is 32 bits long. I think the last one we talked about was 16 bits long. Um, still uses a shift register uh, at each end uh, and works the same. If the message is the same, there's no error. If there is differences in data, of course, then there, then there was, was an error there. Okay, addressing, here's where things get uh, a little bit tricky when we're talking about industrial networks. And if you have no experience, it's a little bit harder to understand, but uh, I was in your seat once too. Uh, so hopefully I can, I can figure this out. Okay, pay attention, addressing. All devices in all networks must have a unique address. In the ethernet, this address is called a MAC address. MAC stands for Media Access Control. It cannot be changed by the user. I have had students tell me that, yes, it can be changed by the user, but you're not supposed to. And generally, it's a challenge to do it if you can do it at all. Don't argue with me about it, but let's just believe it. Okay, it is burned onto the ROM of the network interface card of your device. So if you have a device that communicates a computer, a laptop, an iPad, a phone, Bluetooth earphones, a Bluetooth speaker, it's going to have a MAC address. Uh, you can search the MAC address for your phone if you want. Um, everyone's got one. Okay. It's six bytes long and usually in hexadecimal format and they typically typically look like this, uh, one byte, two bytes, three bytes, four bytes, five bytes, six bytes, and looks something like this. Okay, um, network access method used to get communications is peer-to-peer, -peer, meaning that devices can communicate to any other device on the network. Uh, one on a multi-drop bus, Ethernet uses CSMA, CD, just like most of the other networks that we are concerned about uh, to manage traffic. So CSMA CD is the, is the one that is most commonly used. And now moving to wireless ethernet. So wireless also uses the first two layers, physical and data link. So we'll start out the physical layer and look at some stuff and then we'll quickly move to the data link and look at some stuff and because they're still Ethernet, just one's wired and one's wireless. There's not a ton uh, of differences. Okay, physical layer. Here are some wireless specifications. Uh, remember, I told you was, you know, be able to know that 802.3 is wired. Know that 802.11 is wireless. I, I don't expect to bust you out too hard on what's B, what's G, what's N, what's AC, what's AD. Uh, we're, I think most of us at the home level now are pretty much in this level, but irrelevant for our purposes at any rate. Okay, so for example, 802.11g, which is probably at the time of writing, uh, the most common industrial standard maximum data rate of about 54 megabytes. Uh, second frequency band is 2.4 gigahertz. Um, we're moving more and more up to the five gigahertz uh, range, but notice that we can, we've got a ways to go here. So technology is not through with us yet. Okay, uh, modulation type, because it is wireless, we use some type of modulated signal. And that's why we mentioned it earlier. Wireless travels in waves. The frequency which it travels usually has unique characteristics um, and we pick them based on those characteristics. So higher frequencies have less penetrating power but are capable of transmitting more data. Lower frequencies are the opposite, okay, and, and uh, just think of higher frequencies, more, more peaks, so therefore more data lower frequency, less peaks, so less data. Um, many of them are 2.4 gigahertz, gigahertz um, you know, from 2000 till maybe five years ago. 
almost everything uh, produced. Okay, maybe maybe not 2000. 2010 to, to 15 was 2.4 gigahertz. Prior to that, we had 900 megahertz uh, and we're continuously evolving. But many of us currently still in our homes have 2.4 gigahertz devices, uh, such as our phones, microwaves, garage door openers, things like that. Uh, and that can pose some problems. Um, thankfully, there's broad spectrum and lots of frequencies that, uh, that you, can, you can tune to. Um, I don't know if anyone else has experienced this or not, but here's a, a, an example of how adding more and more wireless devices into our world has complicated things. So my garage door, for example, 2.4 gigahertz garage door, uh, 15 years ago, I could drive up down my alley and I could press my garage door opener a couple houses away and my garage door would open. Now I had to extend my antenna from my garage door opener out over my garage door and out onto the header outside of my garage. And I have to be within a couple of meters of my garage for my clicker to work. And that's because there's so much interference from so many more wireless devices that are operating on this particular frequency band of 2.4 gigahertz. Has anyone else experienced that particular situation with the garage door opener? And I went, oh, is that, is that what's going on? Anyone or am I, I'm just out there by myself. Maybe your batteries are dying. No, they're not, but thanks for pointing. <laughs> thanks, Mr. Obvious. <laughs> All right, well, maybe it's just me. Maybe I got a crappy garage door. All right, so at any rate, wireless signals require modulation because they start out digital in a machine somewhere, and we got to send them a long way, so we got to modulate them. They get to the other end, they got to be demodulated and then turned back into ones and zeros. So common methods to do this are called, here's a couple new ones for you, direct sequence spread spectrum and MIMO. And again, we're not gonna get real deep into these, um, but do know that this, these are a couple of methods that are used for signal converting or modulating and demodulating the signal when sending wireless uh, information. Um, and again, MIMO is more modern and DSS is a little bit older. And if you were paying attention, you might have seen these mentioned over here, but don't panic. We're not getting into them. Uh, I don't think much more than just mentioning them. All right, so let's look at this bandwidth that we're talking about here. So as bandwidth increases, so will the maximum data rate. And you can think of bandwidth as a, as a pipeline, right? A pipe can only flow as big as a pipe is. It's limited by the size of the pipe. Bandwidth is the same. There's only so much of it to go around in a particular spectrum. It's a resource uh, and as such, it's governed. Uh, so people can only use certain bandwidths at a, at a, at a certain space. Uh, radio stations are a good example. You tune into 98.9, that's their bandwidth as a piece of the whole spectrum. So that's kind of why we're going to talk about bandwidths here. So a bandwidth increases, uh, as bandwidth increases, so will the maximum data rate. There are 11 channels in North America, uh, and there's three of them that are non-overlapping. And I'm, I'll tell you why I'm mentioning this specifically in a minute. Uh, channels 1, 6, and 11 in the 2.4 band rate are the most desirable because they are non-overlapping. So if you look here, this chunk of the spectrum 2.4 giga, giga, giga hertz here. So starting at 2.412, whatever, and then going to wherever it goes, one second, Michael. Another second one here. And then the third one here, these three channels, you see they're individual, all the other ones behind them overlap. Each one of these uh, channels is, is 22 megahertz of, of bandwidth assigned to that. Set this up in your router because you're probably in one of these ones sharing data with your neighbor. And if you go into your router and you pick one of these, you'll get faster information. Go ahead, Michael. So does that mean we're only allowed to send channel 1, 6, and 11 during the wireless radio commissioning and the programming? No, you can, you can pick you can pick any one of these channels. And usually the router will pick a channel itself based on... Uh, based on network traffic that it detects within itself. 
Um, and it'll just select from all the ones that are overlapping. I don't know industrially if you would, the idea is you always want to be availability, right? So you don't want to lock yourself into any one of these particular pieces of the spectrum in case it gets loaded up. But if you're in a residential neighborhood or you're, you know, like your house, like I am, you can find out which one of the locked in uh, pieces of the spectrum is, is not utilized as much and you can lock into it and then you kind of can hog some data. Um, but I think for the most part, you want your network to go to wherever the most availability is. But again, I think that's above our pay grade. We don't really talk about it. We don't really talk about it. So any equipment we could have or find in the market to identify which channel has been used? Yeah, like if you buy a piece of equipment that's 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz, it'll contain channel all the channels available in that spectrum. I hope that answers your question. That's not related to this course. Thanks. <laughs> I, I hope that works. Okay, that was physical layer. Wonderful. Not much in the physical layer, of course, because there is no wire, so no connectors and, and things of that nature. So data link layer, wireless Ethernet, same things we talked about in wire, frames, error, addressing, and media access method. Okay, so frame structure, uh, same as the wired with addition of three frames that will address reliability. And here's your answer to your question earlier, Michael, security issues associated with wireless communication. So the new frames are control frames. Uh, that is not new, but we talk about it specifically. And management frames. I think I talk about them. I don't. Okay, so here's our frames. We were how many frames previously? Somebody just say eight. Eight frames. Good job. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, confirmed. They're not. They're not lying to us. Uh, tricky trade. Treat cheat. Eight oh two eleven. Eleven frames. Doesn't work for the other one, but works for this one. Okay, so uh, what do we get? What's new here? Frame type is is new. Yeah. Don't 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 break your don't break your brain on that one. So Michael, security, encryption, here we go. Three basic types of encryption. Some of these you'll recognize if you've set up your home networks or an email account, you would have uh, come across these before. Uh, WEP, WPA, and WPA2. So uh, first one, WEP, wired equivalent privacy. So basically saying this is the same privacy level as you would expect in a wired network. Uh, WPA stands for Wi-Fi protected access. And then WPA2, of course, is the same thing, uh, second version. If given the option, use the last option because it's evolutionary as it so often is in this course. Okay, error detection types for wireless Ethernet. The cyclic redundancy character here is 16 bits long. I think we said 32 on the last one. Okay, data link layer addressing. Again, nothing changed here. All devices and all networks must have an address. It's called, still called a MAC address, which stands for media access control. Can't be changed. So we say, same as before, media access, CSMA, CD, just like before, brings us to objective four. Network components and characteristics. Uh, we'll start with the wired, uh, wired stuff, and then we'll do wireless stuff. And this is, uh, as we go through here, I think it's a little bit, uh, well, let's just say, we start out describing the things that we no longer use, and then we tell you what the replacements are. That's basically the way we're gonna roll. Okay, so components. The purpose of these components is to interface nodes to the network. A node is any user 
that ties into the network somehow. So to do this, we need a couple things. We need a network interface card. This is what allows us to communicate with the network. This network interface card has the address in it. So almost everything has one built in nowadays, but they do exist as a standalone component. So although you may never see the, the NIC, if you're communicating on a wire or wireless network, there is one or you're talking to yourself. Okay, so we're gonna look at a bunch of components here, hubs, switches, routers, firewalls, bridges, and gateways. So hang on for a short but fun little ride. Network interface cards. Every device, PLC, workstation, RTU, controller, telephone, laptop, iPad, Bluetooth, speaker, that connects to a network and sends or receives data is called a node. It connects through a network interface card. They are identified by MAC address. Ah, holy moly. There's what an old school network interface card looks like. If you've ever built a computer or had the desire to spin your PC around, you will see one of those. You won't see one like that anywhere else probably. Okay, we talked about the hexadecimal, six byte addressing and all that wonderful stuff earlier. Okay, most NICs have a feature that can establish the communication speed between devices. It's an internal thing. We're gonna say now a days that all, let's, for our purposes anyway, we're gonna say that all network interface cards now are capable of detecting the speed of the network in which they are being asked to participate. So for example, a 10100 base T network interface card can work at either 10 or 100 megabits. General information, folks. Mac, what does it stand for? Media Access Control. Ah, fancy. Hubs. Okay, so first thing we're going to talk about here is a hub. Hub is the central port of this particular network, which is got a network topology that most closely resembles what topology that we have talked about today. Anyone? Bueller. Star. Thank you. Okay, hubs and switches are used to connect multiple devices to form a network segment. They are similar, but different. I mean, hubs and switches are similar, but different. How are they different? Hubs are dumb, switches are smart. Explain, please. Hubs pass all information in a half duplex format onto everybody indiscriminately, busy or not. So something comes in, it goes out. Therefore, it is extremely prone to collisions which cause delays in signal transmission, and this is not desirable in an industrial environment. So hubs are out. Replacing them with switches, which unlike hubs are smart and they distribute data with some thought and they call this data layer traffic control. So along with the traffic control that's established in the physical layer, it also uses some components of the OSI layer two, which handles traffic control. Switches do this by using tables inside them where they store the addresses of the devices that are connected to them. This allows the use of the address field, the destination address field in each message so that it can go to that address only. If it doesn't match the address, it doesn't send it. Switches also have a buffer, which is like a surge tank or a switchboard operator where the data can be momentarily stored, allowing orderly distribution of the data, thereby reducing the number of collisions. Switches also enable full duplex communication 
by using two pairs of wires, one for transmitting and one for receiving. So although they do the same job essentially, one does it way better. Hubs and switches. Next, oh, guess not next. Beyond switches, there are managed switches and actually almost all industrial networks use managed switches. I'll show you these when we get into the shop. Uh, they do more than just reduce network traffic. They have the ability to set up virtual LANs and in the shop, that's exactly what we have is a virtual LAN uh, controller to controller. Uh, they introduce some security features. Uh, they offer something called port mirroring, uh, next level stuff. Um, the ability to operate as a SNMP, which is again, uh, kind of next level stuff, but applies specifically uh, to things that we actually do use quite a bit in our in industrial networks, but would be in another course entirely. Okay, routers. Most of us have heard of routers. Um, most industrial networks have more than one segment. So we hook all these guys up together and this is a segment. This is uh, uh, plant number one. Plant number two has a similar arrangement. Plant number three has a similar arrangement. Plant number four has a similar arrangement. How do I connect uh, these plants together? What am I doing? I'm essentially connecting these things together. How do we do that? We use routers, okay? Hub, hubs and switches makes a, make the segment and routers and bridges make a subnet or a sub network, which allows connections between segments. And this is where things can get a little bit tricky, but again, don't let yourself get overwhelmed. Uh, we expected you to be experts on this. We would have uh, an entire course based on this. So to step things up a little bit from the MAC address that an individual device uses now, we are going to uh, step back a little. So instead of looking at my house number, I am gonna look at, uh, start looking at my postal code. And I guess a good comparison here. Okay, so the postal code would be my, my sub address. The, the bigger picture, I can use my postal code. It'll tell me uh, what province I'm in, what town I'm in. Uh, what city I'm in. So that's kind of my brain's comparison to this. Okay, so the way they do this, routers use IP addresses uh, and routers are sometimes called layer three switches. Uh, throwing this in there, I guess this is a Cliff Clavin. Uh, they call them level three switches because if you go flip back 100 pages to the OC model, uh, you'll see IP addressing is covered in the network layer. And that makes sense because it is a network. Firewalls. Uh, most of us are familiar with firewalls. As you see here, it's a way of isolating our process network from the rest of the world, basically. It provides us some security uh, and allows us to control the flow of data in and out of the network. Um, using some kind of rules, you know, like the, the president can obviously use them, but Michael uh, at home can't use them. So that type of thing here. So these rules will include things like source or destination address, uh, assigning port numbers, and we'll get into this. Unfortunately, we'll get into this in, a, in another ILM uh, using something called user data ground protocol. We'll talk about that later. Don't hurt yourself yet. Uh, also, port numbers designated using TCP, so different protocols, which we'll talk. Yes, maybe you guys already, let me just look here. You guys probably talked a little bit about, or read about those a little bit in the protocol ILM, but you'll see more about that. Long story short, the purpose is to connect facilities to public networks while providing us with some sense of security. Almost over, bridges. Uh, bridges uh, use MAC addressing and are sometimes called layer two switches. Why layer two? Because layer two is the data layer. And we said earlier in this presentation that MAC addressing or access methods are handled in layer two. And this is why. So physical layer, 
second layer. And here you see this network, this network communicating using this bridge. Don't hurt yourself thinking about it more than that. Last but not least, gateways. And gateways are easier to relate to because let's give you an example. My house is connected to Shaw. Uh, Shaw is cable, which means that the wire coming in my house is coaxial. The wire coming from my uh, router is Cat5. So my router or my blue curve device, which is what it's called for Shaw, is technically a gateway because it connects two different network standards that would otherwise be incompatible, coaxial to Cat5. Okay, so that's what a gateway does. Most of them are multi-purpose devices. Now, gateway slash routers, like my Shaw blue curve thing, but this is the idea of a gateway in a, in a nutshell. The basic thing that a gateway does over just a router, which is same standard, gateways can go between different, different standards and, and protocols. Okay, so uh, inside there, you could have communication signal converters, uh, internet gateways, proto protocol converters, all applications for gateways. Here is where all these components fall in the OSI model here. So what, what components of the OSI model do these hardware components uh, deal with in terms of getting information here to there? So all in one nice little, little chart here. So not gonna elaborate. I think we're pretty close to the end of the road here. Almost. Oh, that was all still wired? Dang. All right, so wireless network components. Good news is everything in a wired network, uh, you almost always have in a wireless network too. Uh, a couple of things to look at. One is a WIC, a WNIC, or a wireless network interface card. And the other is a wireless access point. So look at that, wireless network interface card. What's the difference? Got an antenna instead of a wire access point gateway router call it what you want what's the difference antenna okay wireless network interface card provides the connection to the wireless network and has provisions in order to interface with the physical and data link layers of the oc model they also have a unique address why because they're part of the network so everything in the network has to have an address uh, maybe integrated into your laptop, for example, or a separate piece of hardware, uh, like a card, or back in the day, they used to make, you know, little dongles, 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 you know, thumb drives. Don't know if they do that anymore. Probably do. When I was your age, you were super cool if you could connect your computer uh, to the internet. Okay, any device that connects to a wireless network requires a wireless network interface card. Short but sweet. All the other stuff uh, also applies. Whoops. Wireless ac access point, Starbucks. No. Okay, what does it do? It creates a link between the wired and the wireless networks, often called a wireless bridge. They may also do routing, thus be called wireless routers. So wired network, so let's say this is a closet at the college, has a whole bunch of switches in it, distributes that throughout the college to wireless bridges. And this would be hanging from the ceiling. And if you go to the shop, you'll see, uh, or if you walk down the hallways, you'll see some of these hanging in the hallways. And then us users, students uh, connect to it using our phone or our laptops wirelessly. So that's a wireless access point. And ta-da, that is the end. We still have part B. Are you going to run through the part B today? Oh, no. Jesus, Michael, take it easy. It's Friday. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I was trying to give him a hard time. Oh.
What is this? Man. No. I feel like with all that information we just went 